How do quantum computers actually run? How do they operate on their qubits? How do quantum computers compute? I will explain quantum gates and quantum circuits and how they work and also how they are different from classical computers. But first, I think it's best to start with an example. Before we start with quantum computers, let's start with classical computers, because that's a bit easier to follow. Everything a computer does, from adding to numbers, to retrieving data from memory, to streaming a YouTube video, is just a huge number of bits, zeros and ones, being moved around and stored and copied and operated on. A quick example, what is 34 plus 8? 4 plus 8 is 12, so we write the 2 and carry the 1. Then, next digit, add the 3 with the carried 1 and we get 4. The answer is, of course, 42. I've used the base 10 numbers here because that's what we are used to, but computers can do the exact same thing with binary numbers. All we need to do is add up two numbers A and B and also handle the carry correctly. All of that can be performed by this circuit, for example, consisting entirely of NAND operations. NAND means not AND, and it is a logic gate that produces a single output for two inputs. Now, the details here aren't super important, but the bigger point is, everything that computers do is based on gates, and that's also true for quantum computers. Even though a quantum computer uses qubits instead of bits, and those are a bit more complicated, the same principle applies. Every computation, every algorithm in the end is just gates operating on qubits. Okay, so gates operate on bits and quantum gates operate on qubits. Bits are easier to understand. A bit can simply be zero or one. You can encode numbers and letters and everything in bits, but at the end of the day, it's just something that can be zero or one. And the basic unit of quantum computing is a qubit or quantum bit. And I've done an entire video on qubits, so if you're interested in more background, I will link it somewhere here. But basically, all we need here is the following. A qubit is a quantum mechanical system that has two different states it can be in, which we usually call 0 and 1. And that isn't something special, but a quantum system can also be in any combination of those two states. We represent this fact by the Bloch sphere, an arrow inside a sphere. The arrow doesn't show a direction in space, rather it shows which mixture of 0 and 1 the system is in. It is a state vector. The position of the vector in the sphere is described by two angles, similar to longitude and latitude on the Earth. But with qubits, these two angles can be used to calculate the probabilities to measure 0 or 1. In classical computing, we often use the circuit model to display what a computer is doing. A line represents a wire that is carrying a 0 or 1 signal, a bit. And a box like this indicates an operation on this bit, a gate. For example, a NOT operation will simply invert the bit. It will change 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. The full adder I showed in the intro is another example for a circuit. And in quantum computing, we have a circuit model that works pretty much the same. We also have wires. Even though in a quantum computer, this will mostly not be literal wires, but a particle being moved somewhere or just time passing. There are also quantum gates and those operate on qubits and change them in some way. For example, there is also a not quantum gate, but it is mostly called X gate in quantum computing. So far, everything has been pretty much the same, but there are two things that are particular to quantum gates. Firstly, all operations must be reversible. And secondly, as quantum states can be in a superposition, this allows for parallel computation. It is a general rule of quantum mechanics that the norm of a state vector must always be 1. There are always probabilities for a qubit to be 0 or 1 when measured. And even though those probabilities can change over time, they must always add up to 100%. In the Bloch sphere picture, changing the state of the qubit means rotating the state vector, but keeping its length, its norm, unchanged. So that is what each quantum gate does. It rotates the state vector into a new position. And just like rotations are reversible, any operation on a qubit must also be reversible. Meaning, it must be possible to return a qubit back to its original state. We say, any quantum gate must be unitary. 
And reversibility is not necessarily a quantum thing. Uh, classical computers can also be made to run reversible in principle. However, there isn't enough advantage in it, so we mostly don't do it. But in quantum computation, reversibility is a must. Secondly, as a qubit can be in any combination of 0 and 1, we can run this combination through a quantum gate. And in a sense, this means running our computation on 0 and 1 at the same time. And this may sound great, but it has important limitations that we will discuss later when we talk about measurement. Okay, let's look at some details and some examples for quantum gates. The most basic gate possible is the single qubit gate, with just a single input and a single output. It takes in one qubit, rotates it in state space, and outputs this result. One significant example is the Hadamard gate. It changes each qubit to a 50-50 mix of both states, just with a different phase. And single qubit gates are pretty straightforward, so let's move on to two qubit gates. If we look at the NAND gate from the intro, we see that this gate is not reversible. When we get an output of 1, we cannot know what the input was. Therefore, we need two inputs and two outputs for a reversible 2-qubit gate. The most common mechanism to achieve this is the controlled operation. The first qubit is the trigger and the second qubit is the target. Basically, a single qubit operation is performed on a target qubit, but only if this is triggered by the first qubit. A good example is the controlled NOT or C NOT operation. If the trigger qubit is 0, nothing happens. But if the trigger qubit is 1, the target qubit is flipped. Remember, quantum gates can also process superpositions. So when we have this superposition as trigger and 0 as target, we get this result. Note that this state can no longer be separated and is in fact fully entangled. Quantum algorithms are often based on having access to entangled states, and the C0 gate is the way to create them. Now, we can also go to 3 or 4 or even more qubit gates, but this is where universality comes in. We already know from classical computation that some sets of gates are universal. And what it means is that certain sets of gates can be used to recreate any other operation or combination of operations. For example, AND and NOT is a universal set, or OR and NOT. Some gates are even universal just by themselves, like NAND or NOR. So you can recreate the effects of any imaginable circuit by just using NAND gates. For example, this is a NOT, this is an AND, OR, NOR, XOR, etc, etc. In practice, this means that you can build computers that can do literally anything with just a very limited set of electronic components. There are also universal quantum gates. One universal set is C0 plus any one qubit rotation. This means that when we have a quantum computer that can do arbitrary one qubit gates and C0, this machine can perform any possible quantum computation, in theory. And this was some of the results that made people realize that we might actually have a shot at building quantum computers. The only way to get output from a quantum computation is to make a measurement. In the language of circuits and gates, a measurement can also be considered a gate. The big difference is that measurements are not reversible. Once a measurement is performed, a quantum state collapses into one possible outcome, and that is the measurement result. An important consequence of this is that measurements destroy superpositions and entanglement. On the Bloch sphere, a measurement projects any state vector to either the zero or one state, with probabilities depending on the state vector itself. Intuitively, any vector in the northern hemisphere is more likely to come up as zero, and any vector in the southern hemisphere is more likely to end up as one. We can now address the asterisk from earlier. This collapse is the reason why we can in principle run a quantum computation on every possible input state in parallel, but ultimately we cannot access all these solutions. Measurement will only give one of those, at random. So what good is this parallel computation of all qubits then? Well, directly it is useless. But sometimes there are very ingenious ways to combine all these parallel solutions to get out the information that we're really interested in. And this is where the quantum algorithms come in. Yeah, so this is how quantum computers compute. 
Remember the addition from the intro? A quantum computer can also perform an addition between two qubits, with a quantum circuit like this, for example. In general, quantum computers can perform any computation a classical computer can, by setting the qubits to just 0 and 1. Additionally, it can perform computations with qubits that are any combination of 0 and 1. Also note all the gates we were talking about are logical or theoretical in nature. And in each case we must find a way to realize them with actual electronics, superconductors or lasers. I will do short on this soon. I'm Chris and this is Physics But Awesome. At the moment I mostly do stuff on quantum mechanics, quantum computing and cosmology. If you like this video, subscribe for more.